I want to read a little bit from the book of Judges and the seventh chapter. How many of you have heard of Gideon and his 300 men? How many of you? So, we are in another familiar passage of Scripture. (laughs) Now, I want to do this before we read, and I'm not making fun of what happened a moment ago. We had those preachers and evangelists and missionaries stand, and there was a reason for that. And there is a reason why I want you to do this for just a moment. If you're here tonight and you are not a preacher, you are not an evangelist, you are not a missionary, you are not in what we would call, what we often term, and it's a misnomer, but we use this term full-time Christian service, would you stand a moment? Just stand a moment. Go ahead. You're not a preacher. You're not an evangelist. Amen. All right, thank you. You could be seated. I won't take time to get your names, but I did that for a reason. I want you to look with me in Judges chapter 7, and we'll start reading in verse 1. Then Jerubbabel, Jerubbabel, who is, I always call him Jerubbabel, Jerubbabel, who is Gideon, and all the people that were with him rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. Now therefore go to, proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there returned of the people twenty and two thousand, and there remained ten thousand. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people are yet too many. Bring them down unto the water, and I will try them for thee there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, This shall go with thee. The same shall go with thee, and of whomsoever I say unto thee, This shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. So he brought down the people unto the water, and the Lord said unto Gideon, Everyone that lappeth of the water with his tongue, as a dog lappeth, him shalt thou set by himself. Likewise, everyone that boweth down upon his knees to drink. And the number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, were three hundred men. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, By the three hundred men that lapped will I save you, and deliver the Midianites into thine hand. Let all the other people go every man unto his place. So the people took victuals in their hand and their trumpets, and he sent all the rest of Israel, every man, unto his tent, and retained those three hundred men, and the host of Midian was beneath him in the valley." It came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Arise, get thee down unto the host, for I have delivered it into thine hand. But if thou fear to go down, go thou with Pura thy servant down to the host, and thou shalt hear what they say, and afterward shall thine hands be strengthened to go down unto the host. Then went he down with Pura his servant unto the outside of the armed men that were in the host. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of the east lay along in the valley like grasshoppers for multitude. And their camels were without number as the sand by the seaside for multitude. And when Gideon was come, behold, There was a man that told a dream unto his fellow and said, Behold, I dreamed a dream and lo, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the host of Midian and came unto a tent and smote it that it fell and overturned it that the tent lay along. Now, I'm not going to do it tonight, but one of these days I'm going to preach on the muffin that mangled Midian. Uh, I've got a good title. I just don't have a sermon to go with it. Verse 14. And his fellow answered and said, This is nothing else save the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. For into his hand hath God delivered Midian and all the host. And it was so when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof that he worshipped 
and returned into the host of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord hath delivered into your hand the host of Midian. Amen. Now if we would read the rest of the chapter, we would find about the great victory that Gideon won for the glory of God in this passage. But I am not interested tonight so much in Gideon. You and I are familiar with him. You and I know about him. He is the hero of Judges chapter 7. But I'm not interested in Gideon tonight. I'm interested in another man that is named in this chapter. His name is Pura. We mentioned his name or read his name twice in this passage. Verse number 10. But if thou fear to go down, go thou with Pura, thy servant, down to the host. And thou shalt hear what they say, and afterward shall thine hands be strengthened to go down unto the host. Then went he down with Pura, his servant, unto the outside of the armed men that were in the host. Now I'm going to pray and then when I'm done praying if you'll give me your attention for just a few moments. I want to preach tonight on the company of Pura. Let's pray. Father, we love you tonight. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for what our hearts have already felt tonight in the service. How you've spoken to us. Thank you for that wonderful message from the word of God. And Lord, we want you. We want to know you. Lord, you are the desire of our heart tonight. Now, I pray that you will help your people and help me as I preach. Get glory unto yourself. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now, when we come here to Gideon's uh, great victory in Judges chapter 7, we think about this man Gideon. He is mentioned, if I counted it upright, he's mentioned 13 times alone in chapter number 7. We also read about Gideon in Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of fame or the hall of faith. But there is another man here, and his name is Pura. He is only mentioned twice in this chapter. He's only mentioned twice in the story of Gideon. As as a matter of fact, in our entire Bible, Pura is only mentioned these two times. He is not the he, who what we would consider the hero of the chapter. We would not consider him uh, the main character of the chapter. We would not say, well, this was Pura's great victory. But the truth of the matter is, it was just as much Pura's victory as it was Gideon's victory. You know what Pura was? He was a servant to, to the man of God. A moment ago, we had the preacher stand evangelists, missionaries and you notice that there were a handful of them I did not count them but then just a moment later I asked all of those to stand who were not preachers, who were not missionaries, who were not evangelists and not making light of either group but you know what you were those that stood up and you said preacher I've never been called to be a missionary, I've never been called to be an evangelist I've ne I don't have the call of God on my life to be a preacher but you stood here you know what you were, you were the company of Pura. You were not the one that God called and put in the place to be the leader of the flock, but you are the ones that God has sent to be a helper to the man of God to accomplish the victory. And I want to say to you, you say, well, about preacher, uh, evangelists are important and pastors are important and missionaries are important. And you are right, they are. But I want to tell you, every child of God that gets involved in the work of God is just as important. It is not our work, uh, the pastor work, the evangelist's work, the missionary's work. It is our work, the servants of God working together to bring about the victory for the glory of God. I'm thinking about Pura. Pura was needed for this excursion to go down to the enemy's camp. Apparently, Gideon was a man. When God first spoke to Gideon, he called him a mighty man of valor and he said, the Lord is with thee. But when you read about Gideon, he does not appear to be a mighty man of valor. As a matter of fact, he's so nervous about the whole thing. He wants to put a fleece out and test God and prove God. And then God has to send him down to hear, let the enemy themselves, he wants, God lets him hear the enemy say, boy, we're gonna get whooped by Gideon before he's willing to go down, but he won't even go down there unless God sends somebody to take him down. He is fearful and he is afraid. You know, I think sometimes, and I, I'm trying to be careful here 
But I think sometimes uh, we preachers give folks the idea we never have any fear, we never have any trepidation, uh, we never make a false step, we never wonder uh, what to do. But I'm gonna tell you the truth, a, a preacher just like anybody else, he has his moments, amen. Uh, he's no different. And we need the help of the people of God. We need the help of the poor. As I thought about poor, poor is not like a man I read about in the Bible. Well, I'll tell you his name in a moment. Years ago, when I started preaching, there was a preacher by the name of Jack Grigsby. He pastored the Berean Baptist Church on State Line Road. He was on the Indiana side of the State Line Road. Ohio was on the other side. And I would go and preach for Brother Grigsby. He was one of the few preachers who would allow me to preach. And when I would go there, Preacher Grigsby had a large library. He had books on every wall in that big li- in that big office of his. And he would lock me in the office and say, don't you come out of here until you've read one of these books. So I'd go in there and he'd lock me in the office. He did not have a fancy desk. He had a table, a fold-up table that he used for his desk. On every wall, or three of those walls, all books, and then above that table there were uh, a place where you could put some pictures and things. And on that, on that picture above that table, he had a picture of a gorilla. And that gorilla had those ears that stuck out like this and that jaw like this and it had a a belly kind of like mine and he had his arms folded like this and that gorilla was standing there with that jaw jut out and those ears and his arms folded and underneath the picture preacher Grigsby had printed out this caption Diotrephes loveth to have the preeminence and we read about Diotrephes in 3rd John who always wanted to be in charge he always wanted to have the last word Pura was not like that he didn't have to be the one in charge he didn't have to be the one called in the shots. He didn't have to have the last word in the thing. He just wanted to be involved in the battle. Thank God for folks who say, preacher, I just want to be involved in the battle. Just find me a place where I can do something for the glory of God. He was more like another man in 3 John by the name of Demetrius who had a good report of the truth. That's the kind of man Pura was. I thought about Pura. We don't read about him again, but if we were to read about him again in the Bible, I think the Apostle Paul Paul would have wrote about him or mentioned him in Hebrews 11. And you know where I think he would have been mentioned? When Paul gets through mentioning all those names and he said time would tell to fail, or fail to tell us and he talks about Samson and Jephthah and Gideon and Barak and then he said, he said and others. Amen. I like that little phrase. And others. Paul said there's a whole mess of folk. I don't have time to mention. I don't have time to go through and call their names. But I'm going to tell you, here's what they did. They subdued kingdoms. They quenched the violence of the sword. Uh, they stopped the mouths of lions. I think that's where Pura would belong. He, he's one of those others. i tell you what I'd like to be in the service of God. I'd like to be one of those others uh, that just got in in the battle and served the Lord. Pura may be little noted in this passage, but he's much needed in this passage. Without Purah's company, Gideon would not have had the courage to go down to the host. And without going down to the host, Gideon would not have heard the dream and the interpretation. And without hearing the dream and the interpretation, Gideon would never have had the courage to take Israel down to the fight. And it all hinged upon this man, Purah, that God told Gideon to go down with to hear what the enemy had to say. You know what I'm looking at when I look over this congregation? I'm looking at the company of Pura. I'm looking at those who don't necessarily have to have, make a decision. They're not those that say, well, preacher, this is the way I think it ought to be, and if we're not going to do it this way, I won't have anything to do with it. I'm not looking at that kind of crowd. I'm looking at a crowd tonight who'd say, preacher, we just want to see the will of God accomplished. We want to see Jesus glorified. We just want to get in on the battle and get in on the fight. Thank God for the company of Pura. Now I'm going to say three things about the company of Pura tonight and then I'm going to sit down. I want to say to you first of all this, the company of Pura is a large and considerable company. Now you say, preacher, there's just one Pura here. I know in the text, I know in our account of Gideon, there is just one Pura, but in the scheme of things, there are a lot of Puras. Did you ever think about this? I sit and thinking about this and I thought in the morning program, Sunday morning, when we come in, there are more Puras than there are preachers. There are more promoters of the preaching 
than there are preachers. There are more supporters of the sermon than there are sermonizers. There are more encouragers of the exposition than there are expositors. You come in on the Sunday morning service, one man will stand behind the pulpit and he'll preach the word of God and it is ordained of God that he do so. But sitting out in the pew will be a congregation of poorest. Some of them will be nodding their head. Some of them will be smiling. Some of them will be mouthing the words to those scriptures. Some of them will be raising the hand uh, you said, preacher, I've never done that. Go on, practice it in your closet. It'll be all right. Come back to church on Sunday. Lift your hand up while the preacher's preaching. Say, hallelujah, preacher. Amen. Glory to God. Some of them may be saying amen. I had some folks, I've had some folks shake their heads at me. I had a lady, I had a lady stick her tongue out at me one time. I know you can't imagine that a nice fellow like me, but I like them folks that nod their heads. I like those folks that say amen. I like those folks that smile. I like those folks that raise a hand. Who are they? They're the company of Pura. They want to help the preacher man along. They want to help the word of God to be preached. They may never stand behind the pulpit, but they're excited that the preacher man is behind the pulpit. They may never deliver a sermon, but they're happy to hear a sermon and apply it to their life. They never may never get involved in exposition, but they're excited about the preacher getting up and opening up the word of God and telling them the truth of the words of life. It means something to their heart. It lights, hallelujah, it lights a fire burning down in them. Thank God for the company of poor. Uh, I thought about this in the missions program. There are more givers than there are goers. A lot more folks give than there are those that go. You say, well, preacher, I'm, I'll probably never cross the waters. I'll, I'll probably never go to a foreign soil. I'll, I'll probably never go somewhere and preach the gospel on a corner and have an interpreter. That'll probably never happen. Maybe it, that will never happen. Maybe God would have you do that. But I tell you, if you don't go, here's what he'd have you do. He'd have you dig deep and send somebody else to go. Send somebody else. I was reading the other day in a book by, I think it was by Frank W. Borum. I was reading about a man named Knight. His, he, he was in the Methodist Episcopal denomination and he was he was giving testimony in a missionary assembly they had a they had a missions conference it was the last night and they asked him to give a testimony he got up Mr. Knight said he said he said about uh, when I was a little boy I grew up in a home where we had missionaries come in and he said we had some missionaries from Africa come into the home and he said I fell in love with the mission field and I fell in love with Africa and he said I purposed in my heart that when I grew to be a man I was going to go to Africa as a missionary and he said I grew up and I went to college and he said I went before the board and they questioned me and I offered myself a candidate to go to the mission field in Africa he said but you know I don't know why to this day I don't know why but he said 40 years ago I stood before the board the second time and they denied me they said we won't send you to Africa we will not support you in that endeavor he, he did not say why I don't know if he even knew why he said I went home to my little apartment heart broken in my soul I wanted to go to the mission field and he said I got on my knees and I poured out my hurt and my, uh, my bitterness unto God and he said the Lord said to me in my heart if you can't go then send someone Amen. he said I, I didn't have a good job I knew I couldn't send anybody so he said I began to work hard and I began to work to get promotions and to increase my salary and increase my income and he said, for 40 years, I've been working in business. And he said, tonight, I have laid a sum of money on the altar for missions. Amen. He said, it is a sum that will not just provide for a missionary during my lifetime, but he said it is a sum of money that for 40 years I have been laying aside and as long as money has the ability to gain interest, interest, it will continue to support somebody on the mission field. I'm gonna tell you something, friend. You may not be the one that God sends, but you can be the one that God uses to send someone. In the missions program, there are more givers than goers. There are more intercessors than itinerants. We pray for those who are on the field. There are more comforters than candidates. I'll be preaching sometime and I'll have a, a family come in during a revival meeting and we'll talk a little bit after the service. I noticed them when they come in and I, I, I've been around a while and I knew what they were when they came in and sat down. But after the service, they'll say to me, Brother McBride, we're missionaries. I'll say, is that a fact? I knew they were when they came in. And I said, well, I'm so glad you're here. 
And then I watch as they introduce themselves. And I watch the ladies come, and here's a mama. She's getting ready to take them little babies away from grandma and grandpa. She's getting ready to take them over to a place she knows nothing about. Maybe they've had a survey trip. I don't know. It's a place where they don't know the language. They don't know the customs. It's a place of danger sometimes. And there's, there's a lot of apprehension. And I'll see those ladies of the church gather around that dear lady and say to her, we're going to pray for you. We're going to remember you. We'll send you a card on birthdays. And I thought to myself, not everybody gets to go. Not everybody can be a candidate. But there is a great company of poorest that will comfort the candidate and pray for the candidate and help that one to go I thought about in the music program there are more in the congregation than there is in the choir I love congregational singing I love to hear the congregation sing there are more singers in the choir than there are soloists you say well preach I've never I've never been asked to sing a solo perhaps not but if you're in the choir you're providing that background Supporting that, that soloist that's going to sing for the glory of God. You came and you practiced. You came early. You came on Sunday afternoon while others were taking a nap. And you came to the, uh, to the choir loft and sang because you wanted to use your voice to bring glory to God. That's the company of Pura. There will all, listen to me now, listen to me. There will always be someone in back when someone else is in front. There will always be something done in private when something is accomplished in public. There will always be someone behind the scenes when someone else is on the stage. There will always be hidden, someone hidden when someone else is heralded. Amen. Years ago, I, I started traveling and preaching. God called me to preach and I packed up the family and I needed a trailer. I had a truck, sort of. I had a Dodge pickup truck and uh, I say sort of had a truck and I needed a trailer and so I, I was at the Bean Blossom Baptist Church and where I've been a member for I don't know how long, long time and I went down to the bank in Morgantown and I went in and I, I was going to try and get a loan for a trailer and so I talked to this lady at the bank and she said what do you do for a living? I said I'm a preacher she said, what is your income? What is your monthly income? I said, I don't know. <laughs> she said, well, how about your annual income? I said, I don't know that either. She said, what is your weekly salary? I said, I don't have one. She considered me unemployed. <laughs> she would barely speak to me. So I left that day. But there was a man in our church. My preacher had led him to Christ. And he was the only deacon we had in our church. He would not want me to tell you the story, but he's in heaven, so he can't, he can't correct me till I get there. So I'm safe till I get there. His name was Lee Morgan. He was a logger. Had owned a lot of land. So he was from Kentucky. He spoke in an unusual way. I'm not making fun. He just, he spoke softly and rapidly with a, with a Kentucky accent. And I would say to him sometime, I'd say, Brother Morgan, what would you do yesterday? He said, I was out in the woods cutting logs. I said, okay. <laughs> I wasn't sure what he said. <laughs> so I, I went to church the Sunday after I'd been to the bank, and Brother Morgan met me, and he said, get your loan. I said, no, sir. He said, meet me at the bank in the morning. I said, okay. Meet me at the bank in the morning. So I met him at the bank. We were at the door. He said to me, what can you afford to pay a month? I, I stretched it. I said, $100? Okay. So we walked in the bank. We walked in that bank. That woman that would barely speak to me saw Brother Morgan. She said, Mr. Morgan, how are you this morning? We're so glad you've come to see us today. It was like the president had walked in. <laughs> She said, come to my office. What can we do for you? I just stood outside. I wasn't invited in the office. <laughs> they talked for a few minutes. They came out of the office. He stood there. He was a man of few words. She went back in the back. In a little while, she came out with a, with a contract. She laid it down on the, 
on the counter and said, sign here. I had a loan. I started to sign my name. And I saw the payments. $250 a month. I stopped in mid-signature. I looked at Brother Morgan. He looked at me. He said, I take care of the rest. Amen. Every month I paid 100 He paid 150 Now he would not like me to tell you that. Because Brother Morgan was of the company of Pura. And all he wanted to do was be involved in the work. And that's what gave him his joy. To be involved some way in the work. They are a large and considerable company. They are, secondly, the company of Pura, a loyal and serviceable company. They are greatly usable in the hands of God. Amen. Now you say, preacher, you've left the text. I know I did, but I'm back now. I want you to notice some things about this man, Pura. And I would say to you from our text, first of all, that the company of Pura are a daring company. They're not fearful. How do you know? Because God has already sent home everyone that was fearful. God said to Gideon, you, you ask them. Everybody that's fearful, you send them home. And, and Pura is still there. So he was not a fearful man. He was daring. He was willing to take a chance, if you want to put it that way, for the glory of God. He was willing to do daring deeds. He was willing to put his life at risk for the glory of God to win the battle. They are a daring company. Not only that, they are a doing company. Now watch what it says. Verse number 10. But if thou fear to go down, go thou with Pura, thy servant. As a matter of fact, both times he's mentioned, verse 11, then went he down with Pura, his servant, unto the outside of the armed men that were in the host. Pura is not a man who is sitting around waiting for somebody else to do something. Pura is not a man who's saying, I wish somebody else would take care of this. So I, Pura is a man who both times his name is mentioned, he's mentioned as the, thy servant and his servant. He is a man of service. He is a doing man. I'm gonna tell you what God's looking for. He's looking for a doing man. He's looking for somebody who will do something Thing for his honor and his glory. He's looking for some Puras. They are busy men. Not only are they daring and are they doing, but they are dependable. Now watch what it says. I like the way the Bible puts this. Verse 10. But if thou fear to go down, take Pura with thee. Is that what it says? No, that isn't what it says. It said if thou fear to go down, go thou with Pura. And again, he will say this, then went he down with Pura. You know what? It's as, though, it's as though God said, I'm not sure Gideon's going, but I'm sure Pura's going. Gideon's got some reservations. Gideon's got some fear in his heart, but not Pura. I can depend on old Pura. Pura's going down. So you, it's as though he said, Pura's going whether you go or not. So you just might as well hook up with him and go with him. Wouldn't it be good if God's in the house of God and the service of God, there would be men who say, I'm gonna serve God whether anybody else does or not. I'm gonna be faithful whether anybody else is or not. I'm gonna be dependable whether anybody else is or not. He's a dependable man. They are a large and considerable company. They are a loyal and serviceable company. And here's the last thing. They are a lovely and remarkable company. I think Gideon's or, or, or Pura's are lovely. Say, so, preacher, why would you say that? Well, for one thing, the word Pura means foliage, leafy. I was staying in a house. I'm going to stay in it again in a little while, a, a couple of weeks. I'm going to preach in a place, and they put me in this house. And some folks had this house, and they gave it to the they gave it to the church, and the church is using it for missionaries right now to come through, and it's a mansion. I mean, it's a mansion. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, it's a ma it's huge, and it's got it's got a jacuzzi on both ends of the thing. It's uh, it's just it's just it's just beautiful, and in the back, 
It sits on this beautiful acreage, and in the back there's this long, this long uh, porch, closed-in porch, and I can sit back there. I'm helping them put a library together, and I, it was like heaven. I was sitting out on that porch. I was up to my elbows in books, and I was sorting. And I'm telling you, it was like going to heaven. Is what it was like. And I was looking, through, and I got looking out off that porch down there, out, off in those trees. And I thought, man, it's just so beautiful. But you know what? It would not have been beautiful if it's just tree trunks. But you know what it made it beautiful? All that foliage. All those leaves. You know what the poor is doing at the house of God? They beautify the house of God. That's what they do. They supplement the work of God. Here's something else about the company of poor. I believe they are sent from God. Now, I believe in the call to preach. I believe God calls a man to the ministry. I believe that's biblical. Paul believed that. I believe that. But I also believe that God in His wisdom sends what we call laymen to a church to help the work. And I believe God has sent some folks here. They have an interest to do the work of God. God pointed Pura out. He was not the leader of the battle. He was not the so-called number one man. He was not the man, could we put it this way? He was not the man out in front, but he was certainly a man mentioned by God and sent by God. He said, go down thou with Pura. And so I think God sends families and sends men down to a particular place and he knits a place together in that local assembly, in that local body. And everybody's important to accomplish the work of God. Here's another thing about them being lovely and remarkable. I like to think Puras are standing in for God. When I read this phrase, but if thou fear to go down, go thou with Pura, my mind went back to the book of Genesis. And Jacob has found out that Joseph is alive and he's supposed to go down to Egypt. Joseph has called for him and Jacob is reluctant to go. And God says to Jacob, fear not to go down to Egypt. And then a verse or two later he said, for I will go with thee. Well, God did not say to Gideon, if you're afraid to go down to the camp, I'll go with you. But he said to Gideon, poor will go with you. He was standing in for God. One little fellow, his dad put him to bed one night, turned the light off, and he started crying. And his dad turned the light, and I said, what is the matter, son? He said, I'm afraid of the dark. I'm afraid. And his daddy said, son, the Lord is with you. And he said, I know, dad, but I'd like to have somebody with skin on. (laughs) I know the Lord is with me. But I like to have some folks with skin on around. I'm thinking of things along the way where my heart would be filled with fear, apprehension about doing what God had told me to do. And some good man of God, some Christian, would walk up and say, I'm praying for you, preacher. I'm with you, preacher. I'm behind you, preacher. Preacher, just do what God tells you to do. Are you listening to me now? It's the company of Pura. I'll say this lastly about the company of Pura. They find their satisfaction in being of service to God Amen. and the man of God. Amen. Years ago when I started preaching, this is not my life's verse, but God gave me a ministry verse. It's found in the book of Joshua. Chapter 1 and verse 1. Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that God spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister. Amen. Now you think about that verse. When God was looking for somebody to use, He chose the servant to the servant. Amen. Praise the Lord. He chose the man that ministered to the servant of God. Amen. And the Lord said to me in my heart, and I've not always accomplished it, but it has always been in my heart. He said, if you'll be a help to the man of God, I will use you. And sometimes I've failed. Sometimes I've missed the mark. But it has always been in my heart to 
try and help the man of God in the local church. Amen. I want to say to you, I'd like to be, and really all of us can be, of the company of Pura. To not have to always be the one in front. To not have to be the one who stands and gets, his, gets to tell his name. But to be the one who somehow and some way and somewhere involved in the work of God Amen. and seeing that God would get glory. Yes. I preached here a series of messages some years ago on Paul and the word fellowship. It's already been mentioned. Paul would take the word fellowship, drop the ship off the end and add a, another word. Fellow soldiers, you remember? Fellow prisoners fellow heirs. Paul would use these words, fellow helpers, fellow workers, fellow servants. In 2 Corinthians, he talked about Titus, his fellow help, helper. In Colossians 1, he talked about Epaphras, his fellow servant. In Colossians 4, he talked about Tychicus and Onesimus and Justus, who were his fellow workers. You and I are well familiar with the Apostle Paul. We don't know much about Tychicus. We don't know much about Justice. We don't know much about Onesimus. We know a little bit about him. We don't know much about Epaphras. But Paul didn't say, I'm doing a great work. And these are some fellows that gave me a little help along the way. Paul said, these are my fellow workers. These are my fellow helpers. These are my fellow laborers. It's as though Paul said, not my work. It's our work. Amen. They're helping me in the work. I tell you what we need tonight. I, I want God to call men to preach. I want Him to. I want Him to call men and put them in the ministry. I want Him to do that. I, I want. It, I, I desire that. I pray about that. But I tell you what else we need. We need some pooras. We need some pooras who stand by the man of God, who get involved in the work of God, who say, "Preacher, here I am. I don't have to be in charge." I don't have to make the decisions. I don't have to have the last word. It doesn't have to be my way. I just want to do something. I just want to see God glorified. I want to see the battle won. And wherever I can be used, I want to be used. The company of Pura. I wonder if there'd be anybody tonight who'd want to bow the knee at the altar and say, Lord, I want to be in that company. I want to be the company of Pura. I want to be used of God that the battle might be won Amen. for God's glory. Praise Jesus. Let's stand a moment.